Hello YouTube, and in this video we're going to look at solar panels. Solar panels, or to give them their correct name, photovoltaics or PVs, have become a default technology to charge your batteries for off-grid living. Since the pandemic, there's been a something of an explosion in demand for camper vans and RVs in the UK. And that increase in demand, coupled with leaps in renewable technology in general, has meant there's an increase in customer choice, a reduction in the cost, and better overall technical performance, making it a straightforward decision to add a solar element to our boat refit project. Traditionally, polycrystalline panels have been the norm, but as tech advances bring down the price, monocrystalline panels, which are more energy efficient, are now within comfortable reach of the mere mortal, and I was keen to make sure I enjoyed the best tech I could afford. Obviously for installing on a boat with curves and odd shapes, a flexible panel type was needed, and about 175 watts was the largest single panel that I could physically fit on the deck. I did consider using two panels, but despite their tough and durable exterior, you can't safely stand on them without risking damage, and that might compromise working space on deck, so I chose a 175 watt 12 volt flexible monocrystalline solar panel from Renergy. Now you can't just connect a large solar panel to your battery, as the voltage varies greatly depending on how sunny it is, so you need a suitable control box to make sure you don't fry your batteries. As with the panels, there are two types of controller. The older tech is quite basic and therefore much cheaper. It uses the established principle of pulse width modulation, basically switching the power off and on and varying the duration of each on cycle. Whilst these work well when it's sunny and the battery's not cycled too deeply, this is England. So it's worth shelling out the extra bunts for the much better performance of the MPPT or Maximum Power Point Tracking type controller. As these outperform the PWM type when the sky is grey and your batteries need a boost, which let's face it, is almost all the time. You need to match any controller to the size of panel you have, and to do this is straightforward Ohm's law, where you take the total watts of the solar array, in my case 175, and then you divide it by 12 volts to get 14.5 amps. Add a bit for headroom and select the next size up, which is about a 20 amp controller. As other aspects of the 12 volt head end had already been chosen, to reduce any compatibility problems caused by using different manufacturers, I went with a 20 amp Rover MPPT solar charge controller from Renergy. Installing the panel is the work of moments. This is not its final resting place, but until we get the masts on, it'll do fine for now. And the convenient eye holes means it's straightforward to tie it down to the grab rails. Connection to the panels is made using these robust MC4 weatherproof connectors. The positive uses a female MC4 connector, and the negative wire has the male. So you can't get the panel end wrong, but as the controller just takes bare wire connections, you can take solace in the knowledge that if you do wire it round the wrong way, the controller has reverse polarity protection. Adding the controller to the rest of the system is straightforward as well, just mounting the box close to the batteries, and terminating two input cables and two output cables. So the, the red wire from the uh, bottom of the controller. These two are supplied with the controller and are both black, which is a bit stupid. Um, the red one and the black one I've put in, so that red one you'll follow here, comes through here and directly onto the battery terminal. Um, and the other one is the power for the shunt there. Um, and the, the, they are therefore um, before the isolating switch because you want your batteries to be charged continually whilst the sun is shining. A quick look at the overall schematic then, and we can see how the controller fits in with the rest of the system. Now we've connected the charge controller, um, it's time to set it up. And in order to do that, we've got quite a lot of parameters on here to have a look through. And the best way we can do that is by getting the instruction manuals out uh, of the battery and the instruction manual out from this and we can have a look at what the charge profiles are saying and what the battery management system on here wants to see. Traditional lead acid batteries are just lead plates submerged in acid and whilst AGM and gel are more advanced they're still ultimately just a box full of chemicals and metals. If you put too high a voltage into them they'll become damaged and if you keep them connected to a load they'll keep delivering current until they're completely flattened and again probably damaged. So you will damage the battery, but not much else. Lithium batteries though, 
Well, they're a bit more unstable when they're abused. We all remember Samsung's Note 7 catching fire back in 2016. As a result, a battery management system, or BMS, is pretty much essential with lithium cells, both as a safety feature and to make sure that the performance is optimised. Until fairly recently, the cheapest way to build a lithium battery bank was to buy the cells in their raw format. You connected several of them together and operated it as a single bank. However, you did need a solid technical understanding to make them all work together safely and efficiently, which involved either having a charge controller or battery management system, and getting it wrong was both expensive and potentially dangerous. Lithium iron phosphate technology is quite a lot more stable than the lithium ion used in the exploding Samsung phones, but a decent BMS does much more than just keep the batteries from bursting into flames. It manages real-time control of each battery cell, communicates with external devices, manages state of charge, monitors temperature and voltage, and shuts things down when there's either too much voltage or not enough charge, ultimately improving performance and prolonging the life of the battery. These days though, for 12 volt systems in a motorhome or boat, we don't need to buy the individual cells and separate battery management system. We can now buy the fully packaged box with everything as one single unit, and the price is falling rapidly. The manufacturer matches the cells and sets up the BMS, so it acts almost as dumb as its lead-acid predecessor. User parameters on charge controllers are ideal then if you're using a component system, but in these pre-packed versions it's normally enough just to set the battery type to the right charge profile. But also let's not forget that in this case I've got the charge profile of, of that, um, the, the, the Rover, which is the solar charger, but I've also got the DC to DC. Which, uh, which doesn't have any user set parameters. And I've also got the charge profile that's coming off this one. So you've got three charge profiles. Now, because these three devices are all Renergy, I'm making an assumption, um, and you can probably look at it in the instruction manuals for these two, where you've got a level of customization, um, that the charge profiles are pretty much the same because it's the same manufacturer. Um, but not always true, but that's one of the reasons why I went for the... Um, uh, the same manufacturer. I've got three different methods of getting power into the battery and I've got three different uh, devices doing it and they will all have their own charge profiles. I've set them all to lithium um, and I'm not going to bother messing around with e any of the user parameters on here. Having taken that decision we can use the controller to monitor what's going on. The controller has a lot of information to look at. Here we can see the solar panel voltage which today is showing a healthy 17.3 volts and according to the manual, its optimum operating voltage is 19.5, and it's not a clear blue sky today. On the current side, we're doing even better than expected, 8.98 amps being the optimum here. We can look at a variety of other parameters on the controller screen, like battery capacity and voltage, but those parameters can be viewed on the battery monitor, and that's measuring the whole system using a current shunt, whereas this controller is just measuring the voltage at its terminals. Using the various monitors, we can keep an eye on the battery condition, and if you keep a log of what's going on, you should easily be able to see if something's not right with your system. If everything looks healthy though, it probably is. If you want to know more about the way I put together the entire head end, what batteries I chose, and other methods of charging that we use, then there are links to other videos in the description below. So that's the solar install done. Um, we're getting power in, and uh, the batteries are doing quite nicely. It's, uh, it's working out quite well. I hope you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.